part, our theme is part of the water management and climate adaptation. Our um, research topic was from a blue corridor to an interconnected network, North Sea Ports uh, Cross Alliance. We started um, talking about our research theme and how uh, all of us are based around um, the portal zones as well, and we have a greater understanding of it. And um, since the portal zones are quite next to the water uh, uh, areas, we thought we'd uh, deep dive into it and look at like the local context. And uh, we fell upon Antwerp as it is the second largest port in Europe. And it is a circular economy with uh, different strategies. Um, then we looked at our idea in three different scales. So we went from the city scale to the regional scale to the multi-regional uh, scale. Um, the port zones in the Eurodelta region are at most vulnerable positions with the unavoidable existence of climate change and its high flood risks, yet they are at the best position economically. With water being the common denominator, it's time for a collaborative approach for these zones between the countries in this mega region and propose future strategies. Divided between vertical, the intangible system, and horizontal, horizontal tangible system, we start at the local scale of Antwerp. Um, we looked at the three different aspects. So there's the economy, eco uh, ecology, and society in order to have sustainable interventions. Uh, we, here we have a collage image of, at the regional scale. So we have a cross-border cooperation between core ports with a leading strategy of joint uh, coastal prevention and changing landscapes caused by the impending uh, climate change. Here we can see both two ports uh, that's right next to each other, Antwerp and Rotterdam, which are both the largest ports in Europe. So we started looking at our different scales from, uh, so our regional scale goes from these two ports and the connectivity between them. Um, in order to upscale and impact, we have to actually first try from our uh, local scale. Uh, it must have worked and these results must be in a tangible scale. So we move forward uh, according to that. It has to be an intergovernmental and transnational communication between the different ports. And there has to be a, um, forced, a port, ports cross alliance. Um, there's a two different strategies, which uh, is between the sea ports on the North Sea coastline. And then we move, for, uh, move inwards towards the in, inland waterways. Um, this is the vision of 2050, so transforming the corridor to a network. This is uh, the connection between the uh, uh, seaport um, zones, and then we move slowly towards the inland uh, waterways. And then vision 2070 is balancing the network. So through our vertical system, which is the intangible system, we suggest a, a technological uh, update. We realize that, the, that there is a... Um, there isn't much of a technological advancement in the port uh, industrial zones. And this is how we get our vertical systems going through. And we, have a share, we share our knowledge and information between the different ports. And um, that's how we create this balancing network between the two, two different uh, um, strategies. So here's our timeline uh, from 2022 to 2070, 2022, uh, we're taking actions at a local scale. We're testing out different uh, methods and strategies. Then we go to 2050, transforming a corridor to a network. And then 2070, we have the primary ports uh, empowering the secondary ones. And here's our final image, uh, just a satellite view of our North Sea ports cross alliance. As you can see, we've highlighted all of the portal zones and um, how we're, um, uh, uh, dealing with the climate change and the flood risk, we can the green areas show the buffer zones for the increasing uh, sea level rise. And uh, yeah, we go from a blue corridor to an interconnected network between all of them. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. This uh, we're group six. This is the project uh, Living Delta, the many capillaries. We refer to the project as these many capillaries as a conceptual interpretation of the region as a living organism and how to create these better connections as uh, uh, to create uh, a, better, a better region. So first we focused on questioning what were the problems uh, with the mobility in, in patterns of, of the urban growth at the local scale. Um, and then we started to thought, uh, 
what was the best way to tackle these issues. So um, the way that we thought about is to create a better and faster way to connect the secondary cities. Uh, with secondary cities, uh, we refer to those cities that have the infrastructure but don't have the uh, high-speed rail system to connect with each other. Um, we started focusing on this uh, example of Ghent and Antwerp uh, because there's a slow line that connects seven different cities in between, but there is no direct uh, high-speed rail uh, in between those cities. So uh, by improving these connections of the secondary cities, we try to prevent the urban sprawl along the railway systems and creating cities that won't depend on cars and we leave a space for healthier and natural environments in between the spaces. Yeah, so in order to proceed further, first we realized that uh, we need to an interface where we can consolidate the existing data and also uh, uh, combine it with the future proposals. And then we propose an app that is actually an interface where all the modes of transportation are combined. Uh, and also this app also combines uh, the uh, ticketing system, a combined ticketing, ticketing system that can work throughout the Delta of uh, Euro Delta, and one can move from one point to another with extreme ease. Uh, in order to uh, further progress, we actually phased down our project. And after the very local Ghent and Perp phase, we moved to phase two, where we are connecting primary, secondary street, uh, cities, and then further to enhance this on the larger scale. We uh, propose the connection uh, the, to in increase the length of this connection to uh, beyond the borders and connect uh, 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 France, uh, Amsterdam, uh, Germany, uh, uh, UK, as well as uh, France uh, together and make a, make this region really one uh, uni region. And in the image below, we see uh, very strongly how these different modes of transportation combine with each other. So we have existing railway as we see in the corner, but we superimpose it uh, with uh, a high-speed rail system that connects between the two uh, major cities uh, with a lesser commuting time and also a smaller commuting system in uh, maybe in form of pods, a pod system that actually connects and forms a web of uh, secondary cities and connect them to primary ones as well. And uh, after achieving this, we try to uh, locate few uh, points uh, where we can have a uh, restrict the growth of the city and uh, uh, restrict the urban sprawling of the cities and hence utilize this opportunity to create public spaces which can be used for biking or uh, recreational activities, hence creating an opportunity for a circular economy as well as having uh, these goals in uh, place that we wanted to have a system where cross-border share uh, sharing of resources possible. So yeah, that's the idea we propose. Um, as uh, forming one big system of uh, Euro Delta, which is beyond the boundaries and uh, which is living as well as functioning and always growing. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, we started talking about uh, thinking about this cross border movement in uh, different areas of this region. And then uh, we focused uh, on this area, these uh, three cities, Masrich, Aachen, and Liege because they were so close together and uh, they had this close relationship together. And uh, for the, uh, we started with the movement concerned of, concerned of movement in the border, but then uh, we uh, try to focus mostly on universities and innovation centers in this area and uh, how they can, uh, you know, contribute to a bigger network and uh, we uh, found some information that uh, Leo University must and Aachen are uh, already connected and have this academic relationship together. Uh, but we also thought that, okay, uh, we can strengthen this uh, connection and we can also involve innovation centers and industry directly to the uh, uh, to university and academic research. Uh, so we uh, thought of a, a platform, a kind of platform that uh, can, uh, you know, universities uh, somehow uh, share uh, what they are doing and their research and their project and also uh, uh, innovation centers can uh, you know can be informed and uh, take a look at them and be involved in it and uh, they can be in, in contact directly and uh, also entrepreneurs and industry uh, and also we thought that okay if 
uh, we have this uh, platform so uh, we can have some parts of the campus and university as a as a public uh, area that all these uh, you know uh, industries entrepreneurs innovation centers and academic uh, researchers can uh, meet each other and uh, have this direct relation so somehow we're gonna have this uh, sorry we're gonna have uh, this connection that is in the whole area and beyond uh, because everybody and all the you know entrepreneurs from other parts of the region also can be connected to the uh, to these uh, innovative centers and uh, academic research. Yeah, and so also uh, just to complete a bit what uh, you said, um, the, the main idea is also as we identified when uh, while ad studying a bit these uh, relations uh, relations between these three cities and while we were trying to understand these specific movements through uh, the borders between the three countries. Uh, we identifying um, through the University of Aachen uh, with the presence of university, but also innovation centers, uh, companies and enterprise that are working on the specific technological uh, uh, fields of a high level. Uh, that there was still as often in Europe with the metropolisations uh, effect this uh, will to concentrate a lot of uh, activities and innovations uh, in the same city. So through these uh, strategies, it was the idea also to propose a diverse uh, vision of the uh, territory. And as uh, here in the, this uh, specific region, there is uh, uh, this opportunity of um, um, enjoying already a really good network of transport systems, and uh, urban fabric uh, environments that are able to um, welcome such uh, uh, activities and um, um, uh, education systems also through the university uh, without that it uh, would be interesting to uh, um, to involve the wider range of um, of uh, cities and urban uh, centers uh, within uh, within uh, this process and at the same time, as, as uh, said Matab, with the, this idea of uh, developing like a kind of strategic um, settlements uh, that could be based around um, the um, stations or nodes of transportation systems uh, to uh, enjoy the connectiveness that is already present, but at the same time uh, developing activities on the less developed uh, cities and territories um, reach at the same time uh, also um, goals from the SDG um, some of the objectives about sustainability uh, less uh, movements less uh, transportation system that could be a, a source of um, pollution uh, inclusion also promotes uh, an inclusion uh, vision of the territory um, and so uh, without here in the specific case that having already this collaboration of uh, the th these three universities from these three cities, uh, it could be a, a network to, to be used and a starting point to, to um, create this kind of um, larger um, um, regional collaboration in, by involving other, other stakeholders and other actors. And then with these specific um, visions, we thought that it could be uh, replicable uh, for other um, other fields. So here we start with the uh, universities, so knowledge, but it can be implemented for technologies, innovations, uh, enterprises that are working in technologies, as is the case in uh, Aiken. And um, we thought that this could be replicable also in uh, other other um, places of the this. Um, um, Urban, uh, urban region. So I was part of team two with uh, Karine Vice, Celine Menov, and uh, Tonga uh, Malakovic. And we suggested a magic June for the uh, town of Ustenda in uh, Belgium, uh, which we'll have a look at in the next slide. Uh, yeah, so Ustenda is this town that falls in the Euro Delta, naturally, of course, being in Belgium. Uh, it's a low lying coastal town 
with a strong tourist industry and history support. Um, it also has an issue with uh, sea defences, so it'll help us in our uh, proposal going forward into the next slide. We've got a few pictures of the town just to better establish context on the next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, you can see aspects over here. Uh, it's a uh, low lying town on the coast. Uh, you'll see on our next slide here. Uh, as is a real risk of uh, sea level rise. Uh, we have two maps on the next slide uh, displaying this. Uh, the two hypothetical scenarios where sea level rise to rise by a meter and six meter or six meter. And all of these are extreme outcomes. Uh, this goes to illustrate that the threat which the city falls under. Um, so what is the solution to this? Well, that's present in the next slide, uh, which is the establishment of a magic dune, which is effectively a dike which serves multiple purposes. And we propose that this dike uh, would operate as a, uh, not only purely a flood defense infrastructure, but actually operate as not just an answer to the challenge of water management, but also as an opportunity to uh, achieve these other goals. So we would have the dive service as a public garage, an elevated bikeway, pension elevated motorway, as a multi, uh, multi-modal uh, transfer hub. Um, I would solve a lot of existing problems in the city before even solving the problem of um, uh, water management. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so in coming up with this idea, we drew inspiration from the following images on the new side uh, here that were suggested to us by Thomas who uh, supervised us in parts but also from ourselves. We just really took inspiration from the innovation in their approach to climate defense and also actually I forgot to mention in the previous slide the uh, level of um, green infrastructure we would incorporate into this and uh, that's present in the image on the uh, top right. Um, so the next slide uh, we'll see how we perfect this idea out for Euro Dallas. Of course, on a side scale, it's just an Ostend, but uh, where it'd be successful, it could expand beyond Belgium and into the mega regional scale. And that's the unique thing about uh, water management, with the exception of islands. Uh, it really is always a transboundary issue. And ultimately, if this idea were to prove a success, we could transplant it into these other uh, locations where ultimately water management will prove a pressing issue. Um, and then next we will discuss um, the benefits of this. Uh, so the benefits that water uh, that the uh, like or magic June as we've named, dubbed it, uh, will propose in the next slide here. Um, so yeah, it would offer it would save space for housing, but it would also create space for transport. Uh, it would you know, save existing land uh, from the threats of sea level rise. Uh, and extreme weather events, which would be more common to climate change, uh, and it'll be designed with nature in mind. Uh, so while the main advantage is a greater resilience to flooding in the mega regional scale, it'll also offer benefits uh, elsewhere, and especially in Ustand, which is quite an old town with building infrastructure. The, um, the uh, proposed uh, Magic June will offer uh, will boost the transport infrastructure of the area and the green infrastructure of the area, which are currently kind of lacking, while also solving this other problem. Uh, and then in the next slide, uh, we discuss the implementation of process, uh, who we're involving. So obviously we involve national government and, also, uh, and we've been consultating with stakeholders in the area as to how we can tailor this project to best suit them. Um, you know, so to the extent, yeah, the government's Governments involved with the extent municipality, the province of West Flanders, uh, but then our stakeholders will include private sectors, local citizens, businesses, uh, other things, and we'll hope to achieve funding from investment banks, adaptation funds, and all of the sorts. So ultimately, we start to propose and develop the project in this year, we to do so. And then hopefully construction would start within the next decade and would be completed by that at the end of it as well. Um, and then you could reflect on the success and lay up our options with regards to further um, expansion of the idea and proliferation throughout the uh, region. Uh, in our penultimate slide here, uh, before our references, we'll just have a look at a little map of what it could be and the real core benefits of this project being, you know, mobility, quick space, biodiversity, 
relaxation and that pleasure after. Of course, the inherent protection against uh, the inherent benefit of water management. And then finally, we'll just conclude with our references, which we use to um, make the presentation on the final slide. Uh, yeah. So that's our presentation. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, first of all, also thank you for this uh, nice week. Um, I had a lot of input and it was also fun working together. Um, so our project, we called it the mobility of choice. And we wanted to create a dense network, um, a mega, re uh, mega regional network and a borderless network of uh, different kinds of mobility. And we also focused on the current situation that, uh, for example, if you go nowadays from Cologne to Brussels, uh, you have a very fast uh, train connection, about one and a half hours, but you're very dependent on that one train. So um, if you don't, uh, if that train doesn't exist for any reason during that day, you, um, your travel extends to around seven hours. And uh, so we just want to give more options while traveling and also to kind of uh, scale that down then to different scales so that we um, always create also for smaller cities different choices uh, how to get to places. Um, I just need to check a few ah, here. So basically, you could describe our concept of these uh, different sketches. We have the current situation here, where oftentimes um, you have to go back and forth uh, between two different uh, cities. So what we want to do there to be more efficient, to connect uh, a more logical them in a more logical way, but also connecting them in a way that you always have as I said, two directions to go. And uh, we did that with the creation of triangles. So we took an example from uh, a team sport from, from football, where you always need two players to be available at any point to um, pass to. And uh, that also then enables us to kind of go away from the car mobility because I think a main point why people choose the car nowadays is the flexibility to go uh, whenever they want. Um, but yeah, we, we really hope to, to change that. So um, for that, we focused on, a, um, as I said, mega regional network. We try to work with the existing lines but we are also adding some new high-speed uh, railway systems um, in different areas, also connecting not only the big cities, but including the smaller cities. And then we also focused a lot on the network of, let's say, regional trains, um, because we saw a huge opportunity in them um, to really extend them. Uh, and uh, truly give these options. So when we, of course, do that, um, we and we create a borderless network. We also want to unify it under one system. So for the tickets, uh, so we have one ticket, one app. And uh, for that, we want to join. That would also be the first step in our timeline to join all the different stakeholders, uh, for example, the, the German railway, um, the Belgian railway, and the, and the Dutch railway system um, under one big stakeholder to begin the development. And then, uh, yeah, we further go on by first using what we have, uh, um, existing train tracks, and then maybe add in the future uh, some more. And maybe to make it more clear, we had um, this one example. So we took three different locations. We took Rotterdam, um, Wuppertal, and Mall, which is a very small city in Belgium. And just to give you an example how it is now, so the train connection between Mall and Wuppertal 
would take around six hours and you have to go to Antwerp and uh, Brussels first into Cologne and then finally to Wuppertal. While, um, yeah, of course, it would be more logical to kind of directly go either to Eindhoven or Hasselt uh, and then further down to Wuppertal. Thank you very much. Okay, so welcome to our project Turi Delta, a grid of uniqueness. Uh, so we started with the city of Duren, as you can see here on this small location. Uh, next to Duren, it currently looks like this. So um, one of those cities is Duren, and next to it, you have a really big coal quarry. And um, so it looks like this, really big. Um, and our idea is to make this uh, coal quarry into a touristic area, because one of the challenges of Duren, the coal uh, quarry is gonna um, close soon because it has to close because of uh, sustainable and renewable energy. And because of that, a lot of people are getting in, unemployed in this area. So we have to, yeah, we want to provide them with um, like new, new jobs. So that's why we um, want to create uh, a touristic area of the location. So we want to create um, something like this. This is just visualization. Uh, so a large park um, with a lot of facilities uh, and things to do in the area. And then I'll give the mic to Mose and then he can, ex uh, no, to Parisa and she can explain a bit more about this map. Yeah. Uh, so Duran is between Cologne and Aachen, which is very well connected to these uh, two cities in Germany. And by uh, it is it is very close to Rhenish mining area. And uh, we um, predict that by uh, proposing uh, touristic uh, uh, activities and uh, turn transforming these two uh, mining areas to touristic spots. Uh, some changes will happen in Duren. For example, Duren will expand um, as a, and uh, maybe some services uh, will be needed in Duren. Uh, will can expand along the railways, the, the major railways, uh, especially uh, those spots that are not uh, um, occupied by, uh, by forests. Uh, there are already some uh, batches of uh, residentials exist. So, uh, this uh, light purple uh, defines that our prediction for um, maybe future housings and uh, uh, everyday uh, living services. And actually, along with uh, the other um, railway between two coal mining area, we expect that uh, some services uh, for tourists can be developed, such as hotels, restaurants, and uh, other related. Uh, also, um, we are uh, proposing to uh, expanding our uh, existing railways. Uh, part of it already exists, and part uh, part of it uh, we expose um, that uh, can be extended through the coal mining area and serve as a, a tourist uh, specified railway for tourists to uh, go through these um, uh, the previous. Uh, serving uh, mining areas that are, uh, we are expecting that in the uh, future will be turned to uh, green areas, lakes, and uh, so on. Yeah. And in the next right. step, uh, maybe we are uh, thinking about how we can um, uh, connect uh, or uh, upscale and this idea. Mose, can you explain? So finally, we have taken our idea to a broader uh, scale, that of uh, Euro Delta, where uh, we imagine uh, a grid of uh, unique, uh, unique uh, tourist centralities, uh, which we have categorized according to whether they follow urban practices, uh, such as uh, historical architecture or uh, artistic exhibition or recreation, or uh, uh, natural uh, practices, uh, such as uh, preservation park, uh, sport, uh, education. So we have defined uh, systems of uh, centralities with uh, bubbles that uh, exchange uh, uh, among them. And uh, the final uh, result is uh, to redelta a grid of uh, uniqueness. 
Thank you for your attention. Yeah, so this is our concept as final, uh, like a grid of unique places to visit to create um, a better Turi Delta. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, sadly, I can't see me though, because uh, it's the same device and uh, that's technology technology. But um, yeah, my group was part of the water management and climate adaptation group. And uh, we concentrated on the future of food production in, in this group and uh, agriculture as a main driver for that. So we did a little brainstorm and we looked at uh, the main drivers of climate change um, and 25% of, of the greenhouse gas emissions come actually from agriculture and land use. And um, then we looked further into, into more details and we found out that the Netherlands use 65% of their land for agriculture. It's uh, staggering numbers in Belgium too. And um, the water consumption is also really, really high uh, regarding agriculture and production of food. Um, so from there, uh, we did a bit more research. Uh, we, we found this planetary diet. Um, that is uh, kind of suggesting a diet for the future that uh, complies with the boundaries of the earth, how we have it with the resources. So it's on the very right of this graph, you can see that the greenhouse gas emissions, they have to be reduced radically. Um, and most of it is, a, is in, uh, in livestock uh, production. And uh, yeah, from that, we went into actually the impact of that diet and how it has, uh, what has to change in the future to actually um, apply it. So the, it's a lot of uh, colors, but uh, in general, the food demand is going up um, and we have to deal with the CO2 emissions. We have to, we have to deal with um, agroforestry. So a change of agriculture in the system, in the system. We have to deal with the water usage. Um, we have to also think about alternative foods when we are reducing the livestock foods. And um, of course, all of this can't happen without densification or intensification of agriculture in general. So from there, we jumped into, into a small scale um, kind of spatial idea of how this can proceed over time. Um, and it's just a, an idea sketch of uh, in a timeline where you can see that um, we are using the mobility corridors um, to make agriculture even more efficient, um, freeing up the land that uh, by, by intensifying agriculture around the mobility so that we have the possibility on the, light, uh, on the left and the right um, to use it otherwise for CO2 capturing or for water purification methods and you can see it processing over time growing and uh, yeah this is just uh, some references uh, how it could look like and then this is kind of an a bird eye view on this uh, small scale intervention just showing that the whole process um, of agriculture should be um, combined and densified as much as possible so from growing the plants to processing them, to packaging them and sending them. Um, if you put all of that in one place, um, everything gets more efficient and less um, emissions will be emitted. Uh, we were also thinking about uh, using a lot of the, the places that we free up for, again, water purification and greenification. Um, and um, then we went into a bigger scale thinking about uh, where to apply this. Uh, we've, we found this uh, region um, between the Netherlands and Belgium that is quite heavily stacked with agriculture. So all the white spots you see on this map are actually used for agriculture right now, which is a lot. Um, and from there, we kind of embrace the, the mobility corridors, as I already mentioned, and you can see that um, by intensifying agriculture, by rethinking agriculture, we can actually introduce a lot more green that will help with climate adaptation and water management a lot uh, in the future. So this is kind of the upscale that we, uh, that we did. And of course, this can also be thought 
around the whole Euro Delta. And um, yeah, it's kind of it's a it's a kind of a drastic concept, but uh, it just shows we just want to show that if it's not changed now in the future, it even has to be it has to be even more drastic because uh, yeah, agriculture is one of the if not the main fact, uh, main driver in climate change and to adapt to climate and to to um, really manage the water efficiently we have to think about agriculture we have to bring the stakeholders together on that topic and uh, think about solutions that are future proof so yeah i think that's in, in i try to be very short i hope i i was in time but that was kind of the presentation thank you so um, our project is called the euro delta port cities innovation network so um, we're focused on two things one of them is the an intangible network of uh, in a similar innovative uh, big port cities in the north sea uh, including london antwerp Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and uh, Hamburg. Uh, we propose like a, a cooperation or network between these innovative cities to come together to find solutions, uh, common solutions against common problems they face, including uh, pollution brought by uh, CO2 by ships, vessels coming into the ports, as well as the transport of goods inland by trucks uh, and road transport. These are all common issues that they face, especially in the three biggest ones, uh, Rotterdam, uh, Hamburg, and Antwerp. The pollution levels are really high. Uh, and also uh, to reduce traffic on the roads in these cities as well on, on a local scale that would solve some traffic problems. Uh, so that is the intangible future uh, long-term plan to establish this network, the exchange of ideas, exchange of in, uh, knowledge and innovation. Uh, in the Euro Delta region. And then another more physical and direct intervention we can do is to improve the connection uh, inland from Antwerp uh, and Rotterdam uh, through railways because uh, part of the pollution caused is also by heavy convoys and trucks moving goods and uh, from these ports into the hinterland of Europe. So we propose a more uh, sustainable and more environmentally friendly uh, railway networks that can move these uh, this shipments faster into Central Europe and also Eastern Europe. Uh, choose Antwerp because it's the most uh, inland port in, in Europe and, and a lot of uh, cargo goes through this area and there's the shorter distance between the port and the hinterland of Europe. Uh, we found that the, there are routes to Germany uh, and into and then into the rest of Central Europe, but they are not. There are problems of bottlenecking and also uh, not very many border points. So we propose uh, because Antwerp going to Aachen, uh, the closest border, has to pass through Maastricht in in, in the in the south of the Netherlands. Um, we propose for nations, especially the Netherlands and Belgium, to. Uh, have an op open borders policy when it comes to transporting goods uh, into the rest of Europe. So we can uh, reduce the amount of traffic on the road and we reduce the need for trucks uh, who, who produce uh, carbon and also carbon dioxide into the air and uh, ease the process of passing through borders from the Belgium to the Netherlands and then into Germany. And another route we propose of uh, expanding the borders or reopening new border points is uh, the, the rail yeah, the rail from Rotterdam, the port of Rotterdam to Duisburg. It's another way of uh, moving goods from the ports to um, the hinterland of Europe. Um, and then, of course, in the future, through this network of uh, similar cities, similar sizes, similar functions, uh, we hope to hold like conferences or just events, talks where uh, the intellectual members of these cities come together to exchange uh, innovative ideas to, as time passes on, to cr create more sustainable ways of managing a port, uh, of uh, managing cargo, managing passengers, 
and uh, moving movement of goods from around the world into Europe or outside of Europe. So we can depend less on, uh, you know, old, old uh, ships and vessels and also on uh, managing the traffic on the sea because there's another problem with uh, busy ports is that there's a long wait time for barges and uh, ships coming in uh, and uh, the port does not have the capacity to, to manage all the, the containers and all the goods coming into it. So local port authorities in the short term can come up with policies such as uh, equaling the number of containers coming in and also moving uh, goods out, out of the port to allow ample spaces and to reduce the wait time for ships uh, making the movement fluid and to reduce uh, congestion of the of the of the port and the, of the movement of goods allowing uh, uh, containers and deliveries to move quicker uh, and uh, for that is the gist of our proposal thank you thank you uh, okay, a uh, very good afternoon to everyone. And uh, thank, uh, I want to thank, uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity. It was really great working together. So um, yeah, so the topic that we are trying to address here is a cross-border platform for urban mining. So uh, before uh, we get into the topic, uh, oh yeah. So uh, cities are the minds uh, of uh, future. So this was uh, said by Jane Jacob, but uh, Cities are also one of the main contributors to environmental pollution, energy consumption, and also uh, primary material demand. And uh, in terms of cities, buildings are an integral part of cities, and they account for more than one third of world's resource consumption. So uh, it becomes very important uh, uh, to consider all these uh, environmental issues. And uh, so one of the resource-centric approach uh, uh, that could displace all the conventional practices in construction sector is uh, what we feel is urban mining. So a little bit about urban mining. So urban mining um, basically is the process of recovering materials and elements from uh, used buildings or infrastructure or landfills or waste, perceiving them as uh, uh, the building, uh, perceiving the whole building stock as a unified system. And uh, 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 like after a life cycle assessment of uh, these uh, materials, uh, uh, recycling them, uh, uh, upscaling them, and then uh, uh, storing them in material banks and which can then be used for uh, new projects. So this is like a, a, a quick brief about what exactly urban mining is. So uh, what we are trying to do here is basically the concept is to transcend borders. So uh, our idea is to create a circle economy for uh, borders through the concept of urban mining. So uh, after the life life cycle assessment that I told before, uh, the recovered material can be upscaled and uh, it can be recycled as a new raw material for new projects. So um, uh, uh, there are very few cities that uh, right now have uh, urban mining initiatives. So this is a little sketch of uh, showing the concept about how, uh, for example, a country A has a city which already has an urban mining uh, uh, initiative, but then uh, uh, the, the transport of uh, the mined material from here, uh, um, uh, just inside the country, but then, you know, regulating trade between countries. So this can actually, uh, uh, like, consume less energy in terms of transportation uh, than uh, within the country too. So, so these are some of the things that can be considered. And uh, yes. Okay, so then this is just a brief look at how we kind of thought about it. So um, obviously urban mining as a concept exists already, but then once you go into, once you see how much urban mining, how many urban mining possibilities there are across the Euro Delta region, we started thinking about perhaps doing this cross-border urban mining that could be aided through government structures within the Euro Delta region that incentivize not individuals, rather organizations or institutions to make use of this network. Um, and by incentivizing use of the network or such an integrative use of the network, you also kind of strengthen the public perception of the Euro Delta region as a unit. Um, so that's not just something conceptual um, and out there. Next one. Cool. So this is basically what we conceptualized. Um, it all gets together, comes together at a website. But what you can do is you have a bunch of towns that identify 
materials that could be extracted. Um, so whether it is in the classical sense of using building materials um, from decommissioned buildings or maybe de decommissioned mines, when we look at places like the Rheinisches Revier, um, you have those towns that have their materials, they store it in a certain base, and then you can the base can be a parking lot or a warehouse. Um, and from there, it can be transported to um, other cities in the Eurodelta region um, through existing infrastructure as well, because we're now trying to reinvent the wheel. So existing infrastructure, such as um, waterways and railways, can then be used to transport this across the region. And the website basically, which is the main thing, acts as a database and an inventory where the cities across the region can upload or document um, the materials that they have available and then other cities in the region can see that and then buy it from them. It's like a marketplace for used materials. Next one. Um, so this is basically just a look at what it would be or could be. So we looked specifically in our project of Amsterdam, Brussels, uh, Amsterdam, Leuven and uh, the Rheinisches Revier. Um, but it could also add Brussels because it's a big city right there. Um, and you could start identifying like key or strategic cities within the region. Um, to be part of this. So basically the website is the, the integrating part um, and it acts as an e-commerce, almost like an eBay, um, as an e-commerce site for used materials. There is one or two kind of shortcomings though, is you, the Eurodelta cross or covers a large area. So transporting goods will obviously be expensive if you say, take it from France to the other side of Germany. Um, so that would need to be clarified. Also, the kind of amount or the weight of the freight would need to be clarified. And then advantage would be annual savings stemming from um, urban mining initiatives. And you can promote the cross-border trade and you can overcome resource limitation because Europe is rich in resources, but not necessarily within one specific area. So it's a shared kind of system. And then this is how we thought about it. So these we identified Leof in Rheinisches Revier and Amsterdam as our key um, cities. So Rheinisches Revier, for example, is known for the mining and the decommissioned mines will soon become a problem. Amsterdam is more known for kind of building materials like metal or bricks. And Leofen is known for um, timber. So if these kind of materials could be shipped or, or trained across Europe and then each kind of additional city would their specific product that they specialize in would be determined by the characteristics of the region that they serve and that's the idea thank you uh, yeah so uh, uh, I think there were a few questions before for certain teams like convincing the stakeholders I think uh, uh, to answer that uh, uh, some of the key points that can convince the stakeholders is the, the collaboration that that they can have between these cities and and, and the benefit with the benefits that they get in terms of uh, environmental sustainability or uh, how is how is it economically beneficial and also uh, like uh, we uh, addressed uh, it's it helps tackle resource limitation too and uh, one of uh, the other things that we need to consider is the mobility that the transport of these goods and uh, I think uh, uh, there are there there were a lot of pitches about connecting ports today, uh, uh, especially the one with Blue Corridor to inter interconnected network. I think all of this can uh, uh, can be a base uh, for our particular pitch. So uh, yeah, so yeah. Basically, we're not trying to design anything new. We're just trying to facilitate collaboration and yeah. integrative or integrated yeah. systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay, we are the last team and hope there's still some energy left uh, for our presentation. Uh, our project is called, uh, proposal is called Follow the Moss. And we are basically following the Moss River path. And we think the river offers a spatial conditions that could uh, host so many different collaborations and create many networks that goes uh, transnational between uh, Netherlands, Belgium, and France. And uh, to answer Rupert's question, I think uh, if I was in the charge of this project and I wanted to market uh, this, uh, um, this uh, design, I would uh, call the municipalities of all these cities and say that, okay, we are using this river as a mere canal. And this project it could offer you um, 
a vision that how can we use it as a natural expressway. And uh, yeah, and for uh, inspiration, we had this map that it's the historical map of uh, Mississippi River in 1941. And it kind of depicts uh, all the historical traces of the river through different times and different uh, historical period, all combined in one picture. And I think it clearly shows this dynamic uh, nature, this dynamic power that it is in the nature. And we lose this power through our uh, like last century developments. And we kind of, um, we are proposing that this uh, potential should be rediscovered and utilized again. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we thought that um, we actually, we started other way around and we focus on the mega scale rather than local scale. And we thought that, okay, if we have this uh, sample of a uh, region along Moss River that is mostly uh, blocked by agricultural lands and industrial lands and some uh, urban fabrics going on along the river, uh, these, all these uh, human-made uh, human spaces are disconnecting our green clusters, our natural, natural forests, and our first um, step to revitalize this nature is to connect them again. So we thought of the idea of relocating these agricultural lands as the team three elaborated, uh, the new, the future diets and the new modes of agri production, agri food production especially, uh, could give us this advantage to remove arable lands that are uh, polluting the water, that are polluting the nature, and kind of implement new ways uh, of agriculture uh, like agroforestry, which in long term will be transformed into the natural forests. And then we have these zones of, uh, uh, we can say, agglomeration of uh, agriculture, industry, and urban in certain areas. And then the nature freely um, um, evolves and expands uh, beyond and above it. The next step in our project was identifying uh, the different challenges we had and adjusting them according to the sustainable development goals. Uh, for this reason, uh, we use this framework that uh, categorized the sustainable development goals in three main levels of biosphere, society, and economy, and taking biosphere as the basis um, uh, as the basis of the any uh, future development that we are gonna have, and everything then will be built upon that. So. If we make this categorization, you can see that we have different uh, strategies and actions implemented for each of them. And some of them could be spatial, some of them are organizational, some of them are educational. And we think a clear and efficient uh, approach should address all these different layers into one coherent picture so that it would be both applicable uh, to different situations and also flexible enough for the future. And then we took this toolkit that we made and applied it on the map. So we made a grid upon Moss River path and we said that, okay, if we have these different sets of micro strategies, uh, we could implement them differently according to the needs of uh, different parts of the mass. And even though we are not suggesting one uh, unified uh, design approach to the whole uh, river, uh, in the end, uh, we have this kind of uh, pixelated strategies going along the river that could um, in, in practice better answer to the challenges that uh, this or the opportunities that is uh, going along the river. Thank you.